Good morning. Welcome to chapel. So great to see you all today. This morning we have uh, the wonderful privilege of hearing from a friend to us here at Cedarville, Sam Alberry. I'll give Sam a big welcome. Welcome back, Sam. For those of you who maybe have not had opportunity to hear from or interact with Sam and his ministry before, he's associate pastor at Emmanuel Nashville and also the author of various books, including Is God Anti-Gay? What God Has to Say About Our Bodies. And he's the co-author of a book entitled You're Not Crazy, Gospel Sanity for Weary Churches, which is also the title of a great podcast you should check out that he and Ray Ortland do, entitled You're Not Crazy. So uh, he's also a feller, fellow, a feller. He's a feller at the Keller <laughs> Center for Cultural Apologetics. So, Sam, we're so great to hear from you today. Welcome, always a joy, and we'll be praying for you as you go, and we'll listen with open hearts and minds. Let's go to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that during this time, as we recognize the grandeur of who you are, and Father, that in our creaturely status, we're utterly dependent upon you, yet so easily lose sight of that dependence. Or Father, my heart can so easily fight against that dependence as though something were wrong, when actually, in being weak and dependent upon you, everything is right. And so, Father, we pray that in this moment, help us to lean into that. Lord, we know that you are faithful to meet us with your grace, to sustain us. I pray for these students that you'd keep them well and in this season headed towards Thanksgiving, grant them perseverance. And Lord, as Sam opens your word, we pray that you would use him to instruct our hearts and minds. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and sing with us? the sound of your great name, all condemned, feel no shame, at the sound of your great name, every fear has no place, at the sound of your great name. All the world will 
Good morning, good to be with you. Uh, We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, if you want to find your way there, uh, verses 10 and following. A few years ago, I was on vacation in the the Rockies. There was a big group of us, and one of the things we signed up to do was like an afternoon trip to visit a glacier. Um, And in my head, we were going to like drive, you know, a bit of a way up a mountain, There'd be a nice, like, resorty, restauranty place. We could sit on a, on a nice deck. Someone would bring us nice hot drinks and, and food, and then we'd look across and see a glacier and, and get to marvel at it. What I didn't realize was we would drive onto a glacier and up it. They had these massive kind of coaches with, like, moon buggy wheels and all that kind of stuff. So we drove onto a glacier, up the side of a glacier, and onto the ice field that fed the glacier. I was on summer vacation. I was wearing shorts. And I was wearing, I put on a light sweater thinking, you know, glacier, light sweater would be good. And it is one of the coldest places on earth. And I thought, well, I'm gonna get out of the, I'm gonna get out of the vehicle and just see how far I can count before it is unbearable to be outside anymore, I need to go back inside. I made it to 15. I could feel the marrow in my bones physically freezing. Um, All of which is to to say how you dress can matter. Uh, We tend to pay attention to dress codes. And I mentioned that because there is a dress code for the Christian life that Paul is wanting us to see in this passage. Verse 11, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. Verse 13, take up the whole armor of God. There is a way to dress to be a Christian. There is something we need to put on for the Christian life. So let me read our our passage to us. I'll read 10 down to 17. We'll come back to, to verse 18 tomorrow. So Ephesians 6 verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is God's word. So I want us to think about this in two parts. I want us to think about the need for this armour 
And then I want us to think about the components of this armor. So firstly, the need for this armor. Uh, We are speaking about spiritual warfare, and speaking about spiritual warfare, thinking about spiritual warfare is itself part of spiritual warfare. So we're thinking about things the devil does not want us to consider and won't want us to remember. Uh, We are in a spiritual conflict. And Paul tells us a number of things about this conflict. Firstly, it is not theoretical. Uh, Verse 12, Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against something that is physical, but we do wrestle. He says we wrestle against spiritual forces. We wrestle against darkness. We wrestle against the devil. The fact that it's not physical doesn't mean it's not real. There is such a thing as evil. I was listening to a, an interview on a, a podcast recently, and uh, it's a kind of a well-known secular author who was being interviewed, and he was trying to say, you know, bad things happen because of lack of education, because of lack of privilege, because of poverty, because of poor upbringing. And I'm sure that is true to, to a significant extent, but the fact is there is such a thing as evil. Some things are not just unfortunate. Some things are not just broken. Some things are not just tragic. Some things are actually evil. And for many people today, that raises questions. The passage talks about the devil. But not having a real category of objective evil raises even more questions. This conflict is not theoretical. Secondly, this conflict is not avoidable. Uh, In verse 11, Paul talks about the schemes of the devil. In verse 16, he talks about the flaming darts of the evil one. This stuff is coming at you, whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not. It is not something we can opt out of. It's not something where we think, well, if I, if I just leave the devil alone, maybe he will leave me alone. No, Paul is showing us the devil is already after you. As uh, my pastor sometimes says, the devil has a file on you. He is already coming after you. The threat is not avoidable. Uh, notice next, it's not trivial. Paul says in verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Uh, There are some people who who kind of like conflict. Uh, There are some people who like arguments and confrontation and paintball and gun ranges, anything that involves kind of any sort of combat, they're up for it. And if that's you, then you need to know whatever strength you think you have is not going to help you here. Because Paul says, be strong in the Lord, not strong in yourself. Others of us hate conflict. We avoid difficult conversations. We're anxious when there's confrontation. And Paul's message to us is, be strong in the Lord. You can be. It's going to be okay. It was never about your capacity. You can be strong in him to fight. Uh, For all of us, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Uh, It is the armor of God that we're being given. This is the good stuff. Uh, We're not going to find ourselves with bad equipment. We're not going to be under-equipped. This is the armor of God. And Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. We are being given full spiritual protection. What God provides will be sufficient for everything that we face. Which means this conflict is not impossible. God helping us, we will stand. And God is helping us. And Paul keeps making this point. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Verse 13, Uh, He says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Verse 14, stand. 
having put on the armor. So we mustn't be naive, we mustn't be blasé about the whole thing, but we also don't need to despair. God will help us to stand. He, he will give us all that we need to be able to serve him. Um, I'm a fan of James Bond movies and my, my favorite moment in a James Bond movie is the Q scene, particularly in the older ones which were a little bit more goofy because whatever Q gave James Bond would turn out to be the exact thing James Bond needed, however absurd and ridiculous a thing it is. It might be a, hey, this is a, this is a long pepper grinder that doubles up as a flamethrower. <laughs> so you think, okay, at some point, Bond is going to be in an Italian bistro and there will be some, some kind of conflict. Whatever it is he's given is the exact thing he needs. And that is what Paul is saying here about this armour. It is the whole armour of God. He's factored in all that we need, everything that's up against us. And so what God provides will help us to stand. So that's the need for the armour. Secondly, let's think about the components of the armour. Paul walks us through and shows us uh, what this armour consists of. Uh, Paul is writing this, we see this in verse 20, Paul is writing this in prison. So this isn't theoretical for him. Uh, people tend to, to believe that Paul was probably chained to an actual soldier. And so Paul didn't need to use his imagination to know what armour looked like. He was just chained to this guy and thinking, oh yeah, armour, yeah. And each piece of armour that Paul explains is a, is a different way of saying the same thing. Basically, what Paul is telling us to do is put on the gospel. The gospel is our dress code. The gospel is the armour of God. So let's look at what Paul says. He talks in verse 14 about the belt of truth. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Uh, the main currency of the devil is lies. And so the main counter to the devil is truth. Paul has already told the Ephesians back in chapter 1 that you have heard the word of truth. In chapter 4 verse 21 he said the truth is in Jesus. The truth of the gospel is what we need to defend ourselves. And apart from the gospel we find ourselves living in lies. Uh, my brothers and sisters, that the devil has done a number on every single one of us. Uh, we inhabit false narratives about who we are, about what we're worth, about what God is like. Sometimes it can take years to unearth some of those false narratives that are, have lodged themselves so deep in our hearts and it's why we need the belt of truth. Uh, there's a, a movie you're all too young to ever have heard of, but uh, a couple of guys in the front row will know it. Memento. One of like Christopher Nolan's first ever movies. Oh, well, there we go. Um, basically, that the premise of the movie is that the main character has lost the capacity to form new memories. And he's trying to solve a, a murder case. And so every time he learns a new piece of information, typically he, he tattoos it on himself so that he will have access to it because he won't remember it. And there's a guy who comes along called Teddy. And uh, he takes a, a, like one of those Polaroid pictures of him. So he's got a picture of him. And he writes down immediately on the back of this picture, don't believe his lies because he knows he's not going to remember that. He needs to remember to not trust Teddy. Now, in the end, it was a bit more complicated than that, if you've seen the movie. But when it comes to the devil, that is, that is spot on. Uh, don't believe his lies. The devil does nothing but lie to us. I was chatting with a friend just last night, um, phoning a friend to, to see how he was doing. And he wasn't doing well. He wasn't doing well because his head was swimming with lies. He said, I, I feel like I have nothing to contribute to the kingdom. And I was thinking, does that sound like something Jesus would say to you? 
And he said, I guess not. I said, no, that is not the message of Jesus to his people. That is a lie of Satan. And the alternative to I have nothing to offer the kingdom isn't I'm God's gift to the kingdom. It's not arrogance. It's a humble confidence that actually the Spirit of God has indwelt us and gifted us to play a part. But so many of us have these false narratives and we need the belt of truth every single day. Uh, you have the privilege of, of being here and, and having chapel uh, is it five days a week. I'm sure there are times this doesn't feel like a privilege. But when you leave this place you will realize what a blessing it is to have someone giving you the truth every single day. You need the belt of truth every day. And so whatever disciplines you need to, to cultivate and get into, make sure when you don't have chapel every day for the rest of your lives, make sure you are making sure that you get the truth of God. Uh, verse 14 also talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, central to the truth of the gospel is that we're now right with God. I love the, what we were just singing about. Uh, back in chapter four, verse 32, Paul says, in Christ, God forgave you. At the cross, God treated Jesus as if he was me and Jesus received what I deserve. And it now means God can treat me as if I'm Jesus. I receive what he deserves. Now, some of us come from environments where every single failure is always held against you. And sometimes we, we bring that mentality to Christianity and we think, well, God is just simply unpleasable. Maybe we even think God has created us just to have someone to be critical of. And so we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness the breastplate of righteousness protects our vital organs and reminds us every single day that our sin has been fully dealt with. We are forgiven now. We're right with God. God in the Old Testament promised to hide our sins, to cover our sins, to crush our sins, to cast our sins into the depth. God thoroughly deals with our sins. And we receive the righteousness of Jesus. And that status defends us, it protects us. Uh, verse 15, Paul talks about the shoes of readiness. Shoes are always about more than covering your feet. Uh, shoes are about fashion sense, they're about wealth, they're about what your subculture is. And these shoes speak of readiness. The gospel of peace makes us ready. Uh, we've been given a commission by Jesus to share his good news with other people. Uh, you don't need to be a certain personality type. You don't need to have attained a certain level of education, though well done for getting here. Uh, you just need to have a willingness to go where the gospel is not yet known. And the gospel itself gives you that readiness. And it's not just a, a readiness for the gospel to share it. It's a readiness that comes from the gospel. Because Paul says it is the gospel of peace. We know what it means to have peace through Jesus. We can each speak of now having peace with God and how that has changed us. But we can also speak, as this letter encourages us to, of peace with one another. We now find ourselves united spiritually, deeply, to people we would otherwise have so little in common with. And so we have readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Readiness that can, can make us less, less fearful of awkwardness, less fearful of rejection, less fearful of difficulty. Because we have peace, peace with God, peace with one another. That liberates us to share the gospel. Uh, verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Uh, shields then, apparently, I've looked this up, Roman shields were like full body length shields. We think of a shield and we think of something the size of a frisbee. But these were massive shields and we need them because 
Paul says we're under fire. There are flaming darts of the evil one pouring down on us day by day, moment by moment. We are under attack. And the shield that we take up is the shield of faith in God. And we need to remember that the strength of faith comes from its object, not its size. So the question isn't, have I got enough faith to make a shield out of? The question is, is whatever faith I have in the right thing? Uh, Just imagine two people on a plane. One is just so experienced at flying that they're just going to border the whole process. The other person is absolutely terrified. First time on a plane, absolutely terrified. So the first person gets on, yawns, yawns their way through the safety briefing, doesn't need to know that, just kicks off their shoes, starts dozing, wakes up when the plane lands. The second person is just, you know, on edge the whole time. During the safety demonstration, they're taking notes because they think, I might need to know this. This thing's going to go down. I've got to know what's to happen. Where's the exit? How does this work? Where's my whistle? All of those kinds of things. They're terrified. Now, here's the question. Which person is most likely to arrive at their destination? Well, both of them. The issue isn't, are you nervous or relaxed? The issue is, did you get on the plane? If you got on the plane, it actually doesn't make any difference how confident or nervous you feel. And the same is true of faith. It's not, well, I've I've got nervous faith, I've got edgy faith, I've got anxious faith, I'm unsure in my faith, and this other person's got confident faith, and they seem to know everything. The issue isn't how you're feeling. The issue is, is your faith in Jesus? If your faith is in Jesus, you're going to be okay. Uh, Paul says that the the shield, uh, where is it? Uh, Verse 16, there we are. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. This shield is good for everything. Which is why Paul says use it in all circumstances. There will always be something you can trust in Jesus for at any moment of your life. So when the wheels fall off your plans for your life, when something happens that just devastates you and all the things that you had kind of hoped would come together in your life seem to fall apart, you can trust Jesus. Verse 17, Paul talks about the helmet of salvation. Uh, Paul has made this very clear in Ephesians that we have been saved. Verse 5 of chapter 2, God made us alive in Christ. By grace you have been saved. 2 verse 8, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. We have been saved. So we will be saved. And it's all by grace. It's been done for us by God himself. As my my dear friend Ray Ortland often says, we're 2,000 years too late to mess this up. It's been done for us. Verse 17, he talks about the the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And this is the the sort of the final piece of the armour, but it's the first piece of the armour that's actually an offensive weapon. All the other things are defensive. But uh, the sword is for attacking. And it's... It's a sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, because this sword cuts against spiritual untruth. And so we need to wield it in our own lives. Uh, When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, it was with the Word of God that he responded to each temptation. We need to do the same. We need to know our Bibles well enough so that when temptation comes, we can point to Scripture and say, no, 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 no. That, that is not right. That promise won't deliver. God is, is wiser and better than anything I'm tempted by. Uh, we need to use that sword in, in our own lives. We need to use it in the lives of others. Anytime we are sharing the word of God with other people, anything can happen. 
It often doesn't feel exciting. It often doesn't feel dramatic to, you know, send someone a, a verse of scripture, whatever it might be. But when we're doing that, we are wielding the sword of the Spirit. Anything could happen. So Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. The dress code for the Christian life is the gospel itself. We need to put on the gospel every day. We need to know who we trust, what he's done for us, the right standing that we now have in God because of him. We need to re-preach it to ourselves. We need to make it real for our souls. But there's one final detail we need to see about this armour. And this, this might disappoint some of us. Some of us like to only wear clothes that are new. We don't like to do the whole second-hand thing. But this armour isn't new. It's pre-worn. We're not the first people to wear it. Don't know how you feel about that. But the book of Isaiah tells us that the Lord Jesus himself has worn this armour. Uh, listen to these verses. Isaiah 11 verse 5. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Isaiah 59 17. He puts on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his, on his head. 52 verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. In Isaiah 49 verse 2, this Lord says, he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. So it turns out this isn't just the armour of God because he manufactured it. This is the armour of God because he wore it. And as we put on this armour, we do so realising it's, it's not pristine and shiny. It's scuffed. It's blooded. Because the armour we put on day by day, we realise Jesus put on when he won the battle for us. The decisive victory has already been won with this very armour and we get to wear it now as we seek to serve Jesus day by day. So, verse 11, put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Verse 13, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Let me pray for us. Our Father, we thank you for these truths that awaken us to the reality of the spiritual conflict in which we find ourselves. Father, thank you for providing for us in this. Thank you for this armour that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, help us each day to put on the gospel to re-preach to ourselves the gospel, to remember who we are in Jesus. Help us to understand the truth and to resist the lies. Help us to have confidence in Jesus and in all that he's done for us. Help us day by day, moment by moment, to stand. And Father, we thank you that we, we can do this Assured that the decisive battle has already been won. That Jesus has already gone out to fight for us and secured our victory. So as we put on his armour, would we do so with joy, with confidence, with expectation? For we pray in his name. Amen. Have a great day. Take care.